Hi, we're back again with the network and server upgrades and to start with we're going to have another look at the Microtik router board. So the crimp connections have now arrived so I've created some cables to connect everything up so we'll have a look at that in a moment. And then on the previous video someone commented that the DC to DC converter which is used in this device isn't actually rated for the input voltage uh, which Microtik specify. So when I was uh, creating the video I had a quick look on the internet for the part number and it just so happened that I clicked on a one page data sheet from Lighton which said that it was suitable for up to 27 volts and I didn't really think too much of it at the time. It turns out that that was only a one page data sheet and possibly a preliminary data sheet. Um, the other one which is a multi page data sheet said um, the input voltage range was, was only up to 23 volts and the absolute maximum is 25 volts. So um, I think on here they specify um, a 10 to 30 volt DC power supply. So at 30 volts that's definitely running way out of spec and even at 24 volts that's pushing the limit. So um, we'll have a look on this power supply. There is a potentiometer, I'm not sure if that is the output voltage potentiometer but we'll see if we can adjust it down to 23 volts and then we'll just connect it all up and just check that it works um, as expected. Right, so where we left off last time was the power supply was attached to the case but I was unable to connect up any of the supplies because I didn't have the correct crimp terminals. So I've now created some cables and crimped them up so that uh, everything can be plugged together. Uh, we've got a potentiometer here which I'm hoping is the output voltage adjustment. And then here we have the DC to DC converters in question. So these are made by Lighton and they're the LSP5526 and the main data sheet for this device, uh, revision 1.3 from 2014, does say that the input voltage range is between 4.5 and 23 volts, so definitely nowhere near the 30 volts specified. And I've been having a look at the circuitry here, and there is a MOSFET here, but it doesn't do any kind of pre-regulation, so this is purely just to turn off the uh, supply to these DC to DC converters if they go over 30 volts. But I don't know where they've got that 30 volt limit from. There's only one series diode which takes the voltage um, down by about 0 0.6 volts. So if you supply this with 24 volts you're still getting um, about 23.4 volts on the supply pins to these DC to DC converters. So what I'm going to do is we'll just um, connect at the multimeter and see if we can adjust the voltage down to 23 volts just to make it a bit more uh, sensible. Right, so I've connected up the mains to the power supply and we've got the Fluke 87 connected to the 24 volt connector up here which will go into this board um, and it's reading about 24 volts. So we're going to try and adjust this potentiometer and just see if it drops the output voltage. Obviously you need to be careful and use an insulated screwdriver. Um, don't accidentally use a ESD screwdriver, they are conductive and you will get a shock if you accidentally um, touch something that you shouldn't do in the power supply. And that seems to be adjusting the output fine. So let's take it all the way down. And that's sitting at about 20 volts. So. Um, the board works down to 10 volts, so we may as well leave it with plenty of headroom um, and leave it at this uh, 20 volt setting. What we'll do now is um, we'll connect up the power connector and just make sure that the unit works fine. And then I'll update you on what else I've been working on. So we've got the power light come on. Yeah, and it seems to be booting properly. So let's just check the supply on the PCB and we'll check it after the series diode and that's basically bang on 20 volts so I'm happy with that. Uh, running it above the recommended supply voltage is obviously going to um, reduce the life of these DC to DC converters so that's not particularly good design by Microtik. I don't know why they um, chose to use those DC to DC converters or specified that the input voltage could be up to 30 volts. So thank you to whoever commented in the section below. I probably would have left that as it was and wondered why it failed in maybe a year or so. Right, so we've now got the cover back on and the rack mount is, so that's now ready to go in the network cabinet uh, a bit later on. Right, so I've had to put the fisheye lens on the camera to fit this all in. So while we're at it, we may as well just have a quick look at some cats close up with a wide angle lens.
Right, so this is the server which I'm building to replace the Dell PowerEdge. The case itself is from Novatech, and this is their standard server case, and as you can see it's quite big, so I've had to fit the wide-angle lens onto the camera. The motherboard is an Intel S1200 BTL server board, which I picked up on eBay really cheap. At the moment it's got 16 gigabytes of uh, DDR3 ECC RAM. Um, if I need more, I'm going to upgrade that to 32, but the RAM came with the motherboard, um, so we may as well see how far we get with that at the moment. The processor in here is a Xeon E3-1275, so a reasonably powerful unit. It's about the same, possibly a little bit more powerful than the Dell PowerEdge, but it should be consuming about a third of the power, which is the main objective of upgrading the server. So I decided not to fit the stock cooler which came with the Xeon processor. Instead, I fitted an Arctic cooling 120mm cooler which is quite big, but obviously it's not server grade hardware which may upset some people, but the uh, cooler which came with the Xeon processor is quite small and the fan had to spin quite quick when it was under load, so instead I decided that the noise levels were more important considering this is just going to be in my house. And if something does happen to the fan, uh, the motherboard does monitor all of those things and it'll shut down and alert if something's wrong. Underneath we've got a couple of RAID cards. These are Adaptec RAID cards. Uh, one's a 4-port and one's an 8-port card. The 4-port is the one that's going to be running VMware and the virtual machines. And then the 8-port card is going to be the large storage array. And then I've mounted a fan here. Uh, just to blow along the RAID cards, they get quite hot and they have a minimum amount of airflow which is required uh, for them to work properly, so I decided just to mount a 120mm fan uh, pointing at them. Then at the front we've got the caddy for four 2.5 inch drives. Um, so this has got the back plane built in, so you plug in the SATA connectors but you only need to connect one power connector there. And then above and below that uh, we've got a DVD drive, and then we've got two um, places where we can put four three and a half inch drives in each of those. These don't have a back plane, so what I've done is I've made some cables up uh, with the SATA power connectors, um, and then we'll just be able to insert those drives into there. And then at the front, we've got the hard drive caddies for the two and a half inch drives, so these are removable. Um, so we'll be putting four SSDs in there, and then um, here and here are where the three and a half inch drives go and there's a 120 millimeter fan at the front of each of those. So I've purchased four SSDs. I'm planning to run these in RAID 10. So we should get effectively 240 gigabytes of storage. Uh, so they'll be mirrored and then striped. Um, this should be plenty of space just to run VMware and to store the VMs and then all of the storage is going to be on standard hard drives in the case. So at the moment the 3.5 inch drives are all in the current server and what I'm doing at the moment is copying them across to a computer which I just built uh, with spare parts that I had onto some hard drives in there. I loaded FreeNAS onto that computer just to see what it's like to run with. It actually turned out to be quite a big pain in the ass. I would have been better off just loading Linux or Windows onto that machine and copying files across the network onto there just to store the files in the meantime uh, while I install them onto the new computer. Right, so I've mounted the Samsung SSDs into these caddies, so we'll insert them into here. Whether it turns out to be a mistake to use consumer SSDs in the server, I guess I'll find out in the future. Um, but hopefully if there's any problems uh, I won't lose the whole array and all of the important stuff's going to be stored on the um, three and a half inch drives which are in a RAID 10 array so um, even if these all go wrong I shouldn't lose any data. Right so that's those installed so I guess we can boot it up and see if we can load VMware onto here. So one thing I almost forgot was to fit the battery to the RAID card. So these RAID cards have some built-in SRAM um, which caches the, um, the data before it's written to the disk. So it tries to reorder the writes to the disk so that it's more efficient and therefore faster. But if you don't fit the battery, then if you um, have a problem like the power gets turned off or you reset the device, those changes don't get written to the disk. And because it's all in SRAM, it gets lost um, and it can corrupt your drive. So you're supposed to fit the battery modules to the RAID card so that on the next time that it's powered up all of those changes can be written to the disk. 
Adaptec want £100 for one of these modules, so I decided to take a punt and buy one from eBay. Uh, these were £10 each, uh, but they are used, so I don't know whether the lithium uh, rechargeable battery is damaged or uh, reaching its end of life, so I'm going to fit them and monitor its performance, and then if it turns out that the battery needs replacing, I'm going to see if we can reverse engineer um, the battery module, because there are four terminals, um, I'm assuming one's positive, one's negative. Uh, there is a little bit of circuitry in here. So um, whether I have to take this apart and replace just the cells or whether uh, it turns out that these are all ground and that's just battery protection circuitry, I don't know at the moment. But if there's a problem, then we'll have a look at these in closer detail. And there we go. That's the battery module fitted to the RAID card. Right, so I've assembled everything back together again. Um, the cover's off on the server because you do have to plug the keyboard onto the USB port that's on the motherboard um, to load the operating system. Um, so let's try turning it on and see if it boots. That sounds promising. Yeah, and we've got something on the monitor here. So we will have to configure the RAID before we can install ESXi. There we go. So we have to initialize the drives before we can create a RAID array. Okay, it's initializing those drives now. So it's definitely picked up the um, SSDs happily. Um, we want to create a RAID 10 array. And now we've got our RAID 10 array. So now we can reboot and try and load ESXi. So I'm going to leave VMware to continue installing. Um, we've got FreeNAS in the background, which is still copying files across, so that's still going to take a couple more hours to do. Um, in the meantime, what I'm going to do is load some virtual machines onto the new server, see if I can get everything running properly, and then once it's all up and running, I'll post another update video uh, just to show progress. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give a thumbs up, leave any comments down below or any questions, uh, subscribe if you haven't already, and thanks for watching.